Assalamu alaikum, this is Dr. Mona al author of the Muslim Narcissist book. In today's podcast, I'll be addressing the subject of a toxic Islamic upbringing that has caused many people in their adult lives to either leave Islam, abandon the practicing of Islam, or to become narcissistic Muslims. Now, this is a podcast that has been, you know, awaited for a very long time by lots of people who wanted me to address this because... A toxic Islamic upbringing is what causes and fuels the creation of a narcissistic Muslim identity. And as you already know, this starts from childhood. So what you learn in childhood about Islam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all of these teachings that we go through as children about Islam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they really influence how we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we grow up. And how we see Islam in general. And we will take, you know, on the role models that we had as children. It could be our fathers, our mothers, uncles, aunties, whoever it was. Or whoever they were who raised us. We will understand Islam from them. And how they implemented it in their lives. So just quickly before I go on to the podcast. If you could please like, share and subscribe to the channel. Please share this information with anyone who you believe, you know, could really benefit from it. Liking and sharing really helps the algorithm in YouTube and it helps the videos to reach those who need them the most, okay? So if you could do that, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much. So going back to the subject, now, a lot of people ask me, how is the Muslim narcissist identity created from childhood? It will always come from a very corrupt Islamic upbringing, an incorrect Islamic upbringing. And unfortunately... Our parents, if they were to have raised us in a toxic Islamic environment or in a toxic Islamic way, they would have taken that from their parents as well. They would have taken that from your grandparents and your grandparents would have taken it from their parents and so on. So somewhere along the line in generations, the beautiful message of Islam has been lost as a result of people using and abusing misinterpreted texts of the Quran and the Hadiths to, you know, justify crimes, justify oppression, justify um, abuse on others. So you will often find that the communities that have a very problematic view of Islam come from very patriarchal cultures. And when I say patriarchal cultures, I mean oppressive patriarchal cultures. So as we know, Islam does encourage leadership in societies to be among the men. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given men specific roles. And the term patriarchy has become so negative. It's got a negative connotation attached to it because of the oppression that happened in, you know, in, in cultural patriarchal societies. So men started to take advantage of their authorities and take advantage of their powers. And they started to use and abuse Islam to justify oppression and justify, you know, toxic behavior and toxic crimes that would... Um, happen against women and children and other people so it is really important to differentiate between cultural patriarchal societies and islamic patriarchal societies because islamic patriarchal societies are the most peaceful societies they are the societies that made the islamic golden age so great okay because those societies were built upon a love for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also a fear of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they eliminated as much as they possibly could crimes that happened amongst the people, you know, any chances and, you know, for oppression and, you know, just so many things like that. So when a patriarchal society functions in an Islamic manner, in a true Islamic manner, it, it works. You know, male leadership here works because they are following the Quran and Sunnah properly. They are not taking advantage of their authorities and oppressing people in their you know, in the process. And this makes women more cooperative. This made women at that time more obedient to leadership, to male leadership. And they accepted male leadership because they were truly taken care of and there was justice and there was there was peace. There was so much peace in the Islamic golden age. However, you know, um, patriarchal cultural societies that actually came from pre-Islamic Arabia, this is what the Prophet Muhammad he wanted to reform he wanted to completely reform the concept of patriarchy and change it from a cultural patriarchal system to an islamic patriarchal system however 
Even though he managed to do it, there were some people after his death who felt that they were forced into, you know, into an Islamic lifestyle because they feared the Muslims at that time. The Muslim Ummah, you know, had grown and grown and grown and they'd become so strong and they had to repress their rebellion and they had to repress their distress at having to lead a completely different life to what they used to. So, for example, you know, the powerful men of Quraysh, they didn't like the fact that women now had rights. They didn't like the fact that there was no more slavery. Slavery had to be abolished. They didn't like the fact that they couldn't have 20, 50, 100 wives anymore. So there were people who felt forced to, you know, submit to the Muslim community in order to be protected. And they were offended that, you know, they had to change their whole lives just because, you know, the Muslim community was growing and they'd become stronger. So they had a resentment. They had a real resentment towards the Prophet Muhammad and his people. So what happened after he died was that loads of groups of those people who are not true believers, so they were the hypocrites, right? A lot of them got together after um, the Prophet Muhammad died and they started to rebel. They started to rebel against the Muslim communities and they started to show their, you know, true colours. They exposed themselves as being hypocrites. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he launched Hurub al-Ridda. Hurub al-Ridda was the, um, you know, the wars against those who were trying now to eliminate Islam because they they never agreed with the social structure that the Prophet Muhammad Sallam came with. So... Abu Bakr as Siddiq he launched um, the you know he launched this war against them to eliminate them so that they would not spread their corruption. So they went to war against the Muslim first, and then Abu Bakr as Siddiq he in defense for and to protect the small Muslim community at the time, he was forced to wage a war because he knew at that time if they were to run and gather armies from you know, the enemies of Islam at the time, they would overpower, they, they, they feared that those armies would overpower the Muslim community and Islam would be completely wiped out. And everything that the Prophet Muhammad did, and the Sahaba did to ensure the growth of the Muslim community and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's word, you know, gets, um, you know, or reaches other people. They wanted to make sure that none of that went to waste. None of that went in vain because they had suffered so much. This small Muslim community suffered so much at the hands of the oppressive you know, Quraysh tribes. Bear with me, there is a reason why I'm telling you this story because I just want it to make complete sense to you what I'm going to say later on in this podcast. So this has to be the introduction for you to understand how we got to this point in 2023. So... When Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, when he launched this war, he didn't manage to catch everybody, right? Some of them were caught as prisoners and other people were killed, you know, um, of you know, amongst the hypocrites. And some of them got away, okay? Some of those people got away. Now, when they got away, they wanted to go and set up their own communities once again that were the same as pre-Islamic Arabia, Okay, so the same social structure, the same oppressive patriarchy, the same of everything. But they went and they did it elsewhere. So let's say, for example, they went to Asia. They went to what well, South Asia, they went to East Asia, they went to Africa, they went to you know, lots of different parts of the world and they established their communities there. They dispersed and, you know, and started their communities there. And that's why when you go to different parts of the world... Their patriarchal communities are exactly the same as that of pre-Islamic Arabia. And it's from those people who had um, escaped at that time. Okay, they went to set up their own societies. Loads of them claimed to be prophets as well afterwards. You know, claiming to be a prophet sent after uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There was so much corruption that happened after the death of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, so during the Islamic Golden Age, those people weren't a part of that. The people who had escaped and had gone to other parts of the world, they were not a part of the Islamic Golden Age. The Islamic Golden Age had implemented, like I said, the Islamic patriarchal system that worked. And there was world peace everywhere. And the Muslim Ummah was so powerful at that time that nobody could defeat them. Nobody could defeat 
the powerful armies of Al Khulafa Al Rashidin. Okay, so they, you know, the Islamic Golden Age was the global superpower. So, what happened during this era, in this time, Islam was so elevated and it was practiced in the correct way that, you know, to the point where, you know, poverty, for example, was eliminated in the reign of Umar ibn Khattab. You know, in, in the time of Salah al-Din al Ayyubi, there was, you know, there was peace in Palestine and, you know, there was just so much justice and he was just to his prisoners so many people converted to islam during their time because of how amazing al khulafa al rashidin were and all the muslim leaders that came within that time whether they were military leaders or whether they were um leaders over their portions of land and communities okay so there was justice and there was peace so many people came to embrace islam and the more people traveled the more islam spread the more people, you know, embrace Islam, even in Europe. And as we know, the Islamic Golden Age reached so many countries. However, those people who had escaped and had set up their patriarchal, their oppressive patriarchal cultural societies in other countries weren't able to do anything back then. So they had set up their societies in countries that al Khulafa al Rashidin hadn't reached yet. Okay, Islam hadn't reached those parts of the world yet. Or they waited until the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the last remaining Islamic empire that fell in 1922 after World War I. So after the fall of the empire, that is when the, the, the oppressive patriarchy started to come back, right? In the 1920s, it started to come back and people started to go back to pre-Islamic Arabian ways of living in Africa, in South Asia, in the Middle East, and wherever wherever else you find these the same toxic cultural patriarchal societies. Now, during the Islamic Golden Age, I'll come back to this point in a minute about the spread of the um the toxic cultures, but I just wanted to make a note that during the Islamic Golden Age. The upbringing of children in Islamic terms was so different back then to what we see today. So I'll give you an example, okay? Young boys in school were observed, were observed by their teachers. And if the young boys in particular were seen to have a very high IQ, you know, they think outside the box, they like to seek knowledge they're emotionally intelligent, scholars used to scout them, okay, they used to go and pick them, and then they used to train them up to be judges, because Muslim scholars at that time knew that in order to be a judge, you need to be smart, you need to be highly intelligent, you need to know how to read people's body language, ulum al-farasa, the art of studying body language, it comes from the Arabs, okay, it came from the Islamic golden age, body language, how to read people's energy, how to read people's behavior and their reactions, all of that came from the Islamic golden age. So children were taught all of these things in order to make them judges. I'm talking about this, you know, these particular boys, they were taught this knowledge so that they would be excellent judges. And that, again, that's why we had the Islamic golden age, because they picked the right people and the right boys to have those positions because those positions weren't for anybody. You can't apply. You couldn't apply for those positions back in those days. You needed to be chosen for them. And you were trained from a young age and they would invest in your strength. So if they see that you are very, you know, you're highly intelligent, you'd be observed. You'd be observed and then trained later for something that would be very suitable for your level of skills and the gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given those, given those children. So they were really invested in, people really cared about children and you know, it wasn't a one fit schooling for all like it is today. You know, kids go to school and they're all given the same things to learn and you know, some some children might not be good at maths and they feel like failures when they just can't do it. Not all kids have the ability 
to be mathematical like other children. But back in those days, in the Islamic golden age, they would teach children in accordance to what their strengths were. So if they saw that they had, you know, a mathematical brain, they would give them more, more of that. And if they saw that they were not doing so well in science, for example, then they wouldn't pressurize a child to understand sciences, but they would encourage other boys and other girls who did have a talent for understanding science easily. They would give them, you know, um, roles. And that's how we had, you know, the best mathematicians, the best um, scientists, and all of them came from the Islamic Golden Age, okay? So those boys were picked to be judges, boys and girls who were amazing at, you know, memorization, recitation. They were picked to be scholars because they were able to memorize a hadith and Quran verses. So they were the ones who were trained to teach people about the deen. And if you had any other skills, then you were put in those places. So if you were good at science, then you would be put into research. If you were good at biology, you were trained to be a doctor, so on and so forth. Okay, so it was actually the responsibility of the schools as well to make sure that children are placed in the right areas in accordance to their strengths. So back in those days, the best children, like the children who were highly intelligent, they had the positions of judges and scholars. That was what was so important in order to you know, continue the generations of passing on Islamic knowledge and practicing fairness and justice among the people. However, now, in the era that we live in, the generations that we live in, it's been flipped. It's been completely flipped. So if you look at Saudi Arabia, for example, if you did not get the grades to let you enter university, you go to Islamic studies. So the failures now in Saudi from college or from high school, if you get such bad grades and you do not qualify to study medicine or engineering or any other subject, you get immediately sent to Islamic studies. So Islamic studies, unfortunately, now in the Middle East has been connected to failure. And as a result, you will find that it's only the poor families who send their children to the mosques now to learn the Quran and to learn about hadiths. Because the elite families, the middle to upper class families in the Middle East, associate Islamic studies with failure. So the children who go to the mosque are often the children who come from poor families and the parents of um, children who come from middle to upper class families don't want their children associating with other children who are bound to be failures as adults and will go on to study Islam. Okay, it's the sad truth, but that's what's happening right now. So when teenagers and young adults are sent to Islamic studies, the the Islamic studies department, most of them go with a feeling of number one, being a failure, number two, um, they're going to study something that they don't even like or they don't want to study. And three, they feel forced. That this is the only way I can actually get a career later. I have to get my Islamic Studies certificate. I don't want to do this, but I've got to do it. And then these people become our judges and scholars in the Middle East. People who have no love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or very little love and very little fear. They only did it because it was the only option they had. It was the only option that they had to get a certificate to work with. The amount of corruption that is happening in the Middle East now because of this, because the judges that are placed in, you know, places of high, in positions of high authority and scholars, they have, if you honestly, if you watch a lot of their lectures, if you watch a lot of their talks, if you go to a courthouse in Saudi, you will understand what I mean. It's almost like they hate religion. They hate women. They're highly misogynistic. They've got a hate for everybody you will find a very small percentage of judges who are genuinely empathic and, you know, they want justice and they'll hear the side from both the man and the woman and they'll they'll do the best they can. You will get them, of course. There's good and bad everywhere. But those young judges and scholars who 
felt that they had no other choice but to apply for these positions, they don't know what they're doing. IQ is low. They have no passion for the dean. Whatever they did, they did just to get grades and pass so that they could get a job at the end of it. And then we have a messed up social system, a completely messed up social system. So this has contributed greatly to the toxic view of Islam that a lot of people have. Because when you go to a courthouse, and that's in the UK as well, that's in the US as well. You go to a courthouse and it's like you're dealing with somebody when you're dealing with a judge. He's not qualified, he doesn't even like his job. He's fed up every time someone comes into the room or they come to have an appointment. He's fed up. He cannot clearly see the problematic behaviour of the man or the woman that someone's clearly come to complain about. He can't see it because the emotional intelligence isn't there. The, you know, the skills, the psychological skills of reading body language isn't there. And they don't want to do it anyway. They're doing it because they just qualified. They managed to pass their exams and now they're a scholar or now they're an imam. So because these people have come down in the lines of generations and they are the ones who are teaching us about Islam, our parents and our grandparents have got a distorted, a very distorted understanding of Islam themselves. Okay. Now bring that together with the patriarchal societies that were reset up, okay, that were re-established in different parts of the world, it's a recipe for disaster. And that's why when you go to Pakistan, you go to India, you go to Saudi, you go to, you know, you go to Nigeria, you go wherever, you will find the same pre-Islamic Arabian oppressive societies until now, until 2023, I still see Muslim communities that are built upon the works of those who re-established the oppressive patriarchal societies. Until now, women are shamed for being divorced. Until now, there are forced marriages and female circumcision and men taking the inheritance of women and women actually being pretty much bought and sold as wives because it's the family that takes the dowry in marriage rather than the woman. There's a, there are a lot of Bedouin societies until now who still do that. And that was a practice that happened in pre-Islamic Arabia, where the family of the woman would demand such a high dowry, the man would pay her family and she wouldn't get a penny of it. Because it was seen, women were seen as a commodity, women were seen as objects to be bought and sold back in those days. And that's why until now you have men who still deal with the dowry like they're buying a woman. You still have it. I've heard it so many times that a man always says, well, I paid a dowry so that I could have, you know, a woman who cooks and cleans for me. And like, you haven't bought somebody with it. But this comes from Jahiliya. This comes from the mindset of Jahiliya. How did we get to this? We got it from those people who reestablished those oppressive societies. And, you know, feminism came along because... They wanted to completely abolish patriarchy, not just oppressive patriarchy. They wanted to abolish male leadership completely because women believed that they could do a better job than all of these oppressive men. And that's where it started. Feminism is the complete, you know, desire to abolish male leadership in societies. And it didn't come from nothing. A lot of it came from the Western world as well. A lot of, you know, women from the West also suffered at the hands of oppressive patriarchal men. If you read novels and stories from, you know, 18th century um, England, you'll be shocked at how English men back then were like Arab men and Asian men. They were the same. It's because the poison of oppressive patriarchy seeped into societies after the death of the Prophet Muhammad And, you know, oppressive patriarchy did already exist in different parts of the world, when, you know, the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, you know, came with his message, but it was more of, you know, it was more about those who had escaped, who had escaped um, the vicinity of being in a Muslim community, who made it a mission to re-establish, you know, the, um, the societies that they had pre-Arabia. They wanted them back. They wanted those societies and those practices come back. 
So unfortunately, many of our parents and grandparents were raised in those oppressive cultural societies. And instead of knowing the difference between Islamic patriarchy and cultural patriarchy, they just did what everyone else was doing. Okay, and again, this is something that the Prophet Muhammad he used to, you know, warn his people about. You know, don't do things just because your forefathers did it. And that's what they always used to say to him. You know, are you going to are you going to eliminate and abolish what our forefathers and their forefathers have taught us to do? They didn't accept it. But a lot of people, they continued, you know, uh, accepting and encouraging the growth of toxic patriarchy until we got to where we are today. And we still have the same problems today like we did back then. Like we did, you know, back in those days. So this is where a lot of the toxic Islamic upbringing comes from in our own homes today. And people can be narcissistic for many different reasons, as I've explained before. But when you're raised in a household in which Islam is enforced upon you, like forced down your throat as a child growing up, and not just Islam, I'm talking about a very toxic understanding of Islam, then people will understand how a lot of people become narcissistic Muslims, okay? Because a toxic view of Islam contains a lot of narcissism, a lot of the ways in in how people view Quran verses and hadiths comes from uh, comes from narcissism. The way you view a Quranic verse or hadith comes from your own narcissism at that point. So for example, what I mean is if you are narcissistic and you're a control freak and you just want control over everything and everybody, then when you read the Quran or when you read the hadith, you will read it with that perspective. You will obtain what you can and justify yourself being a control freak with your own interpretation of what a verse means or a hadith means. Now again, a lot of this comes from a lot of scholars. So again, if you look back, I don't want to name scholars, so I don't get you know backlash for it and anything. But there are highly problematic, misogynistic scholars, especially in Pakistan and Saudi, who preach the wrong understanding of Islam, a very harsh and strict understanding of Islam where there is no room for manoeuvre. It's too strict. They want people to live in 2023 the same way the Arabs lived and the Muslims lived in 7th century Arabia. It's that very, you know, Wahhabi, um, strict understanding of Islam that's taken very literally rather than spiritually. So when you take this understanding from scholars because okay he's a scholar now he knows what he's talking about this is how I'm going to raise my children because it's going to be easier for me to have control over my children when I raise them in this Islamic way when I raise them and scare them into compliance so they take on the teachings of problematic scholars in order to have control over their children okay and the reason why they do this is because they themselves weren't taught how to be emotionally available with their own children, you know, how to sit down with them and communicate with them. And instead of just, you know, making them hate themselves for a mistake that they've made, you know, they don't sit with their kids and say, hey, Baba, look, you know, you shouldn't have done that. And the reason why I got a bit upset is because you could have burnt yourself, you could have done this, you could have done that. Like they, they didn't have that emotional capacity to be able to teach their children in that way. So scholars would often preach that if you want the easiest way to get your children to comply, use Islam. Use Islam and scare them. Scare them into compliance. So if your parents didn't have loving parents themselves who sat with them and who cuddled them and who would, you know, they would accept them making mistakes they wouldn't attach their children to themselves, to their own sense of worth and, you know, sense of achievement. So, for example, the more a child is compliant, the more the parent feels like they are a success, right, as a parent. But if their children keep making mistakes growing up, they now feel like a failure and they have to resort to God's punishment. 
I'll come on to that in a minute. God knows how long this podcast is going to be, but I'll try my best. I'll try my best to not keep it too long. So a lot of children were raised to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not love him. Okay, so Allah's mercy was completely taken out of an Islamic upbringing. So when children made mistakes, instead of them being told, it's okay, no worries, I don't hate you, I'm not mad at you, you know, you made this mistake, it's fine. Instead of them being told that and being comforted, that it's fine to make mistakes, you learn from your mistakes, they are told that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not angry with them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't love them anymore. And it's so dangerous when they are when children are told that, when they make an innocent mistake, and when they want to stand up against injustice. So for example, maybe you know an older sibling did something to them or hurt them and they stood up to that sibling or they were unjustly hit by a parent and he's you know, he or she stands up to their parent and says, Why did you why did you hit me? You shouldn't have done that. And then the parent goes crazy. How dare you? How dare you question me? How dare this? Allah's going to punish you for that. Allah's going to throw you into the hellfire for that. So there's this tactic of scaremongering children into believing that they're just going to get thrown into hell. What's the point? What's the point in even trying? If at the end of the day, I'm damned and I'm cursed for life anyway, because my parents told me that. I don't know any different. This is the Islamic upbringing and teachings that I'm receiving and I'm learning about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being a, a God who is tyrannical and barbaric and not loving and not merciful because every single time a child does something wrong, a child or a teenager or you know just someone within the age of, I'd say, between 3 and 20, 21, if all they know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every time they make a mistake, every time their parents get upset, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to throw them in hell and punish them. They're not going to grow up with any love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because they don't know about his mercy. They're not being taught about his mercy. Now it's not in a parent's, a narcissistic parent's favour to tell their children about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. Unless it's in their favour to do so. So for example, a child may make a lot of mistakes. And then they keep hearing again and again and again. Allah's going to punish you. Allah doesn't like you. Allah doesn't love you. And then the child panics. The child panics because they don't want to go to hell and they're terrified of punishment. So now they have to redeem themselves, right? So the parent, in order to regain control, because now they're seeing that the child is losing hope, the child is like, well, why bother? I'm just going to continue being naughty because I'm going to hell anyway. The parent has to regain that control and say, look, if you want Allah to be pleased with you, if you want Allah to be happy with you, you need to do what makes your parents happy. And if you make your parents happy, you you know, Allah will give you a chance to get back into Jannah again. So the child has hope again. You know, the child is manipulated in this trauma bond where it's like, Allah loves me, Allah doesn't love me. Allah loves me, Allah doesn't love me. According to what the parent wants to tell them. And what the, according to when the parent decides Allah loves them and Allah doesn't love them. So they will do anything at that point to make their parents happy in order to redeem themselves with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not knowing, not knowing that children are not accountable for their sins. Up until the age of puberty, if a child dies before the age of puberty, they are not accountable for their sins. So it doesn't matter what mistakes they make. It's only going to irritate the parent. For example child spills milk on the table, you know, a child, you know, runs into the house with muddy shoes or whatever it is, it's something that will irritate the parent, but not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because they're children. They are not aqil baligh yet. They don't, their intellect hasn't fully formed because it's the parent's responsibility to teach them right from wrong. And they also, mahum baligheen, so they haven't reached the age of puberty. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not looking at children's mistakes but parents do. Narcissistic Muslim parents will use it, will use Allah's wrath to control children because they just can't be bothered to communicate with their children effectively. Or they don't know how to communicate with their children effectively. So now children grow up learning about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a really horrible way. There's no love. There's no love for Allah. It's just fear. 
And you will not always respect those who you fear. Sometimes you'll have a deep resentment for those you fear because you feel oppressed by that by that person or that, you know, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you feel like you don't have any choice but to comply. I'm now doing things, not because I want to, or out of respect, I'm doing it because I'm terrified of going to hell. So children grow up with this, almost a hate for Islam and a hate for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they're not taught about Allah's mercy. They're not taught that Allah will forgive all your sins if you repent before you die. And children are not prepared to have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beyond the age of puberty. So by the time children reach the age of puberty, they are already thinking of all the different ways they're going to rebel as soon as they're out of their parents' house. Why do you think you have so many sheikhs and imams and scholars who have children who are the complete opposite of them? The complete opposite. Daughters and sons, they go into prostitution, drinking, clubbing, weed, drugs, alcohol. You name it, they do it. You name it, they do it. Because they were never, yes, their parents are imams and scholars and knowledgeable people, but there's no love. There's no love or spirituality in an Islamic upbringing. So now children are starting to learn how to manipulate using the deen. They're starting, especially boys, they're starting to manipulate from a very young age using the deen. They're starting to understand that manipulation is power. I can scaremonger everybody into doing what I want if I manipulate them with this understanding of the deen. So a lot of boys grow up becoming misogynistic, becoming, you know, but deep down they have a deep hate of the deen, by the way. A lot of these staunch, you know, staunch Islamists that you find now, you know, do this and Allah said this and Prophet said this and they are the ones who hate the deen really deep inside because they were raised with no love for the deen but they gain the power from being that way they gain the power from being that way i promise you look at every single person who's like that who goes around judging everybody telling everyone what to do quoting hadiths here and there quoting quran verses everywhere they are the most miserable people inside they are hard-hearted they are miserable they have terrible marriages and they have terrible relationships with their children and they're always complaining about wives being rebellious and children not listening, then there's something wrong with your understanding of the deen then. But a lot of boys especially, like I said, and girls too, a lot of girls will do it as well. You know, you'll find those women who are extremely, you know, they come across as being extremely practicing and they cover from head to toe, you don't see their face, you don't see anything. But they are so hard-hearted inside and they're so judgmental of everybody. And... It comes from a hatred of the deen, a deep hatred of the deen. They feel resentment. They feel like they have to be that way because of how they were taught. And they feel like they have to be that religious and come across as being that religious so that they don't get judged. And so they don't get punished and thrown into hell. So anyone who does a little bit less than them in their practicing of religion is judged. And they're told, you know, sister, you doing this, it's not right. You know, Allah's going to punish you for that. Allah's going to hold you accountable for that brother you know the way that you you know you do this and do that you didn't do your wudu properly you didn't do this why are you observing other people with that kind of scrutiny focus on yourself but they are always the people who go around picking at people's faults islamically inside they are the unhappiest people because they did not grow up with a love for the deen and their morality and their behavior completely contradicts what they were taught so if he was if he's if someone's a scholar or an imam or a Qur'an teacher or a hadith teacher and they abuse their own children, sexually abuse their own children, you know, um, they beat their own children knowing, knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns anyone who hits an animal or a child or a woman. You are people of knowledge. You've read this in the Qur'an, you've read this in hadiths. How can you still do that? It's because you are not convinced of your own religion. You are not at peace yet with your own understanding of the religion that you were taught. You're not at peace with it. And that's why your actions contradict what you know and the knowledge that you have. Because you haven't come to an understanding between you and yourself about the religion that you follow. You yourself don't agree with it. 
but it's benefiting you in some sort of way. It's benefiting you, you know, in power. Maybe people look up to you because they think that you're so religious and, you know, they give you that attention and status as someone being a scholar or an imam. There's some narcissistic gain from that. And I did speak about this in a previous podcast about Muslim hypocrites. So when you are raised to have a fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not a love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will grow up to be someone very bitter. Very, very bitter. And you will struggle to find the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every hardship, in every experience. You will always believe that Allah hates you. Allah's punishing me because I did that when I was little. Because my mum told me that would happen. Watch when you have children. Your children are going to be horrible to you. Your children are going to be this. Your children are going to be that. And then when it happens, they're like, my mum was right. My mum was right. I've got naughty kids now. Allah hates me. That's how people lose their iman. They cling on to all the things that their parents had told them when they were younger about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no hope. They have no hope. And that's why a lot of narcissists who are Muslims, they have no hope. So they just carry on. They carry on. They're like, I'm damned anyway. I'm damned if I do and damned if I don't. Let me just carry on because there's no hope. And the shaitan wants people to have that toxic understanding of Islam because when you have a toxic understanding of Islam and your view of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so bad then he knows you're not going to repent he knows you're not going to find that love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's why you find a lot of people who go to the mosque five times a day they'll pray they'll fast they'll give charity but their heart's not in it their heart's not in it it's just what they've been programmed to do it becomes a chore it becomes something that they just do to fit into their Muslim society. So when they pray, they don't enjoy the prayer. They don't enjoy fasting. They hate fasting. They dread Ramadan coming. They dread praying Taraweeh because it's so long. Their heart's not in it. The spirituality and the love and the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the connection of your soul, you know, to your nafs, there is no connection. It's, it's completely disconnected. So no matter what you do, you just can't enjoy praying. You find it so difficult to wake up for Fajr. You find it so difficult to do anything for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you're just like a robot. You're just like a robot, um, you know, you know, trudging through life. But you don't treat people well because there's no love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will do better in life when you love Allah more than you fear Allah. Because like I said, what you fear, you don't always respect. But what you love, you respect. And who you love, you respect. So when you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will treat everyone else fairly because they're all a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a creation of the one that you love so much. But when you fear, it's always just about avoiding hell. And if you're constantly connecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hell, then you're going to be a miserable person. You're not going to be a happy Muslim at all. Also, a lot of parents, when they sent their children to mosques, you know, you send your children to the mosque to learn the Quran and Hadith, and they get beaten by the Imam. Beaten by the Imam, abused by the Imam, molested by the Imam, you know, mocked at, um, you know, made fun of because, you you know, children couldn't memorize a few ayat because they're not good at it. Not every child is good at memorization. As, you know, scholars say whoever memorizes the whole Quran will go to Jannah. Not everyone can do it. Not everyone can do it. Whoever has the ability to memorize should memorize. If you can't memorize, you can't memorize. You're not going to go to hell for not memorizing the Quran. But, but Muslim parents will, again, shove that down children's throats because they want to boast to the community, oh, my son's a half, my daughter's a half. But the children are suffering in the mosque because... They're not good at memorization and they're being tortured and punished for not being able to do it properly. So they associate the Quran and learning the Hadith with punishment. Like what kind of religion is this? I can't wait to grow up and get out of this. I can't wait to grow up and not be Muslim. I never want to be Muslim. I don't like this God. I don't like this religion. Because they associate learning about Islam and learning about the Qur'an and reading Qur'an with pain and torture and very bad memories. You're forced into it as well. It's not something by choice. You're forced to go to the mosque and, and teach under all of these 
weird, weird imams who have no, lots of them don't even have a fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many, how many imams have people caught, you know, molesting children in, in mosques and, and taking advantage of vulnerable situations and vulnerable children? And again, it's because the right people are not becoming our imams and they're not becoming our scholars because it's not by, it's, it's not by choice, it's by public vote. So Islamically, those who become imams, judges and scholars, they come, they, they, you know, they come to have those positions out of public vote, not because they've applied. The Sahaba never used to apply for these positions because of the responsibility attached to it. But now people are running because of this, you know, running to grab those positions because they, you know, they hold high status and everything. So children are now forced into growing up in a very backwards Muslim community. It's a very backwards Muslim community where Islam, you know, the Prophet Muhammad came to elevate us and, you know, make us progress, help us progress. And we've gone backwards. We've gone back to pre-Islamic Arabia. And it's, there is a hadith where the Prophet Muhammad said that the end of times will not come until Muslim societies go back to the way that they were in pre-Islamic Arabia. So we're heading back there now. We are going backwards. We're not going forwards, we're going backwards. And I remember as well in the Middle East when um, I grew up, some of my you know, some of my childhood was in Saudi. And my dad used to um, buy us these Islamic tapes, these cassettes that he asked us to listen to because we were banned from listening to music. Oh, God forbid he ever catches us, you know, listening to any music. Um, he'd go nuts. And we never understood why. So one of the things that, I couldn't stand about my father growing up is that he would say no to so many things and not give any explanation because he wasn't raised to ever give any explanation. When a parent, when a narcissistic parent wants so much control over their children, you cannot ask why. You, you, you shut up and you obey. There is no explanation for you. I'm the parent and I tell you what to do. So again, children grow up with resentment. Like, you know, why couldn't my dad just tell me why? Why did I just get a slap and be told to sit down and shut up and never question a parent ever again? Because if you do, you're going to hell. If you do, Allah's going to hate you and be upset with you. And then you get told, oh, I'll never forgive you. And if I never forgive you, you'll never enter Jannah. How many times have people heard that? How many times have children heard that? Teenagers heard that? If you don't do as I say, I will never forgive you. I will die never forgiving you. And then you'll have no chance of going into Jannah. This is a childhood trauma. This is a serious childhood trauma. And I remember asking him, like, just explain, you know. I don't understand the logic behind you saying no to me doing this or that. He would never explain. Never explain. Because he, he was so in need of that power and control that people just say, yes, sir. You know, yes, sir. And narcissists are like that, narcissistic parents are like that, husbands, wives, they're all like that. They just want a yes sir or a yes ma'am. No explanations. So you grow up with a horrible understanding of the deen. Because you don't understand, you don't understand why these things are forbidden. Things that you want to do, why music is forbidden, why can't I just listen to, you know, um, what, what everyone else is listening to. Now, back in those days, I remember um, Britney Spears and the Spice Girls and all of them, you know, they were coming out and, you know, being so innocent, you don't understand the lyrics of those songs. So my dad, every time he used to hear me listening to the Spice Girls or Britney Spears, he would lose it, absolutely lose it. And I never understood why, because I was too young to understand the lyrics of those songs. Now, as an adult, I'm horrified. <laughs> I'm horrified that I used to listen to those, you know, to those tracks um, at home knowing that my dad could hear, but had he told me back then, I wouldn't have been so... I used to stand up to him a lot, and he used to... It created a horrible relationship between me and my dad because I was always standing up to him, saying, you know, why? Just give me... I used to demand answers. What is so bad? Now, had he just sat down and explained, it would have solved so many problems, and I would have avoided a lot of childhood trauma just from this alone and a lot of people go through this a lot of people I know have gone through the same problems because 
our parents were of the same generation and the same upbringing. So he used to buy me these tapes, these cassette tapes, and they would always be so morbid because they were recorded by, you know, those Saudi scholars who were just so toxic. And they would be screaming in the, in the cassette, screaming, shouting and, you know, screaming about the hellfire and every kind of punishment that there is in the on the Day of Judgment and, you know, how these people are going to hell and these people are going to hell. And I used to hate them so much. And if I don't listen to them in my cassette player, he would play it loud at home <laughs> so everyone could hear, you know, the, the tapes. And I used to have nightmares. Me and my brother used to have nightmares about the things, like the detailed descriptions of punishments in those cassettes and like people who die, you know, and what happens to the dead bodies of those people who die in sin and oh, just like horrible, horrific things. And it just made us resent, you know, the Dean, it really does. I don't think a lot of people understand how much you push your children away from the Dean when you focus so much on the morbid things. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is so much more than this, but because they're void of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love, you know, in their own hearts for him, they can't teach it. If you don't have that love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your heart, you cannot teach it to your children. It's not possible. Narcissistic parents see children as an extension of themselves. So if you make a mistake, they just see it as being completely unforgivable. You've shamed them now. And they compare you to them. I never did that growing up. I never, you know, I never drank alcohol. I never smoked. I never um, did this or did that. So they shame you. There's such an element of shame that comes into this type of Islamic upbringing. Because if they, sh if they can shame you enough, then you'll stop. Right? Then you'll stop. So they, they attach themselves to the outcome of their upbringing of you. So much so that they control your adult lives as well. Okay, they, they control your adult life so that um, they themselves don't feel like a failure in society. So if you decide to leave Islam, if you decide to go and get a boyfriend or a girlfriend, if you decide to, I don't know, wh whatever it is, then you will always, even as an adult, be reminded that, they, that you will not be forgiven by your parents because you've let them down. You have not replicated exactly who they are as people as well. They want you to be exactly like them. They want you to be miserable and, you know, and they see themselves as being religious. This is another problem that a lot of people face growing up. The Islamic, you know, the Muslim role models that they had in their lives were so bitter and so depressing. So the same parents who are teaching their children about Islam and you've got to be Muslims and, you know, we have to die as Muslims and Islam is the best religion and everything. Those same parents are the ones who are having meltdowns all the time, screaming, having narcissistic rages, threatening suicide. But they're seen praying all the time. You see this a lot with women, actually. You'll find a lot of um, Muslim mothers from our mother's generation and the generation of our grandparents, always praying, always with a subhanallah in the hand, always astaghfirullah, alhamdulillah, subhanallah, all the time. Always talking about the deen, always watching YouTube, you know, Islamic videos on YouTube, always listening to the Quran, always watching the haram and the Kaaba on the TV, on, on Islamic TV. But they are so miserable and so depressed and they threaten suicide every five minutes. Oh, I wish I was dead. I wish I was dead and I didn't have children. I wish I was dead in this. I wish I was dead in that. Where's the Islam? How has Islam benefited your life if you are so depressed and so miserable? Children see that as well. So now they associate Islam with depression. They associate Islam with bad memories of their parents. It's a childhood trauma. Like I have a male client who said to me, his mum's always praying, always praying, very religious woman. But she meddles in his marriage so much to the point that him and his wife have such bad marriage problems because of his mum. She's toxic, but she prays all the time. She's always talking about Islam. She loves talking about Islam, but she backbites and she makes fun of people and she's horrible to his wife. And they live in the same house. 
But she treats her like a maid. She treats her like she's nothing. And he says, I am terrified of raising kids in the presence of my mother. Because I'm so terrified that they are going to take on an, an Islamic understanding from her behaviour like I did growing up. He said, I, it took me years and years and years to break out of such a toxic Islamic mindset that I had taken from my mother growing up. He's like, I didn't understand that Allah is merciful and loving until I, you know, I went to university and I met um, beautiful Muslim people who taught him a different, you know, a different perspective on Islam. And then he realised how toxic and how, you know, problematic his mum's understanding of it was. She used and abused it, you know, to gain control. This is a massive problem in our societies. Because so many adults leave Islam when they're, you know, when, they're, when they can. They wait for that opportunity to either rebel completely when they're out of the, their, the clutches of their parents, of their religious parents. Or they leave Islam and they become atheist or agnostic or, you know, they decide to just not associate themselves with any religion whatsoever. Or they remain practising, but they have a deep resentment towards Islam. They, they don't like it. They don't like being Muslims. But they're doing it because they feel like they have to. And that's why you get contradictive behaviour in people because they look practising, but the way that they live their lives is so problematic and so against Islam and so, you know, there's something not right about the way that they live their lives. Like, they'll look practising, but they'll commit zina and they'll go to clubs and they'll go to do all of these major sins. When I was doing my PhD, I was interviewing um, converts who had decided to later leave Islam or they had issues with Islam. And they said to me, one of the issues that they found because they were already struggling with their practicing of the deen, is that in the in, at Sawas, for example, um, they would see a lot of Saudi students and Amarati students, Qatari students, and they wouldn't be practicing Muslims at all. So these converts were hoping to get some inspiration and some help and support from the Arab Muslim students in the university, but they saw the opposite. They saw that the people who had come from the Holy Land were actually worse than the people that they knew because they were in bars all, all the time, they, were, they had girlfriends all the time, they were doing all sorts of stuff. And they couldn't understand how people who came from the Holy Land could behave in such a way and not be Islamic at all in their identity. This is why. Because they're raised with such a horrible understanding of Islam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they want nothing to do with it. As soon as they get a moment of freedom, as soon as they are able to leave the country to go and study abroad, they go all out. And they will go all out on everything that their parents warn them not to do. It's, it's like um, a rejection of the deen that they were brought up with. Because that's not me, that's never been me. I was forced into that by you. Now that I'm out of the clutches of my narcissistic muslim parents i can go and do everything because they don't understand what islam really means if they really understood what islam meant you know they would be better people so a lot of people don't understand you know how can people in saudi not have the right understanding of islam it's because of this we have very corrupt scholars in islam because they're not chosen to be in that role by the people they are in those roles because they were failures as college students and university students. They didn't want to study the deen. A lot of them hate women so much. A lot of them have their own childhood traumas. A lot of them have their own issues with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it comes out in their teaching. It comes out. So, you know, always ask yourself, when you listen to a scholar, when you listen to an imam and like give a lecture, in order for you to ask your conscience if this person is truly teaching the right understanding of Islam, ask yourself, genuinely, would the Prophet Muhammad have loved this person if he was here? Would he have agreed with this perspective? Would he have, you know, encouraged this scholar to keep teaching? If the answer is no, then you have your answer. Because when you're honest with yourself and you ask yourself, you will know who the problematic scholars are.
because they come across as very that there, there is a there is um there is an element of hate in there somewhere especially when scholars talk about women until now we have forced marriages how is this possible how is it possible that until now women are being forced into marrying disgusting men men who are much older than them men who they detest women who they don't like because there's a benefit in in it for her family so many haram practices unlawful practices are still you know are still happening because of al-jahiliyyah jahl this is the narcissism that's in our islamic communities it all comes from this it comes from a very problematic understanding of you know allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then another thing with the upbringing is another thing that you know children and teenagers really hate and even adults too is that when when the parent is upset and they give that silent treatment that unbearable silent treatment People who are God fearing and you know, or do have some love for Allah's paths, either feel guilty, even when they're not in the wrong. They know that the parents are in the wrong. The parents are toxic, but the parents will practice the silent treatment for ages. And now you're worried about dying, and your mom or your dad are not happy. You know, they're not happy with you. You've got that guilt. You need to go and rectify things with your mom or your dad. And if it's not the silent treatment, you get bombarded with YouTube videos about the rights of the parents. <laughs> You'll get that until you are sick to death of listening to any Islamic video that comes your way. Any Islamic video you get sent, you don't want to open it. You don't want to open it at all because there's a trauma attached to it now. You get bombarded with loads of Islamic videos about punishments, about the rights of the parents, about what happens if you don't listen to your parents. And then people eventually get really sick of it and they decide to never raise their kids as Muslims, never send their kids to mosques. So many people now, in our generation, and in my generation, they do not send their children to mosques anymore. So I heard the Ofsted now recently, they are going around mosques to make sure that children don't get beaten anymore in the UK for learning the Quran. And that's only something recent. Recent, that's happening. Like, we are seriously facing a crisis. And then other people, as adults, they grow up never wanting to visit their parents anymore. Because of all the childhood trauma and the way that Islam was used and abused to make them hate life and hate themselves and hate religion, have no hope in themselves whatsoever. You know, children can grow up really hating themselves because they believe that they will never be loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they grow up not even wanting to visit their parents in old age anymore. They want nothing to do with their parents. They will happily fly to the other side of the world and stay there so that they don't have to live with their parents or have their parents meddle in their lives with their children's lives and their marriages and everything because they don't want their toxic you know, influence to, to come into their home now. And then parents complain. My kids don't want to visit me. My kids don't love me. My kids don't ask about me. Well, how did you raise them? You raised them to have no hope. So what do you expect now in your old age? The, the guy or the guy, you know, the woman, they've already lost hope. You think they're going to come and, you know, do things to please you now? You've already told them 20 years ago, there's no hope in you. Allah's not going to forgive you. Why are you complaining now that your kids are not coming to visit you? I'm not saying I'm not saying it's justified, but I'm saying that a lot of parents they will have that depression and that anger that their children in old you know, when they're in old age don't want to visit them. They don't want anything to do with their parents. And they can't understand why. It's because you have raised your children to not love anything apart from you. And when they see you, they see someone who's depressed and crippled and they just don't want to be around you anymore. So emotionally crippled that it's killed a part of them emotionally as well. And that's why we have a crisis now at the moment of men in particular not wanting to take care of their elderly Muslim parents. And the responsibility is given to the women and their family. So the men will, you know, fly off somewhere or, or, you know, move far away. Even if he's just down the road, 
He doesn't want that responsibility of taking care of his parents because his parents were never loving. They were never, you know, nurturing and they were never kind enough to raise them in a, in a nice way. Boys in particular will always resent that. They find it very difficult to do that out of genuine will to look after their parents in old age. So their sisters get lumbered with the burden of looking after narcissistic parents in their old age. And women complain about it, saying, I can't move on with my life. I can't get married. I can't, you know, I can't have children because my brothers have abandoned the responsibility of my parents. They don't want to be around my parents. They don't like them. And now I've got to give up my youth and my life to look after them. And until now, living with them is, is torture because they keep complaining about my brothers. Your brother doesn't do this. Your brother doesn't do that. Oh, I wish I was dead. Why did I have children? Why this? Why that? It will cripple you as well to live with Muslim, not Muslim parents in old age because the toxicity never ends. It never ends. Narc parents always believe that you owe them, just regardless of what you do for them. Regard, sorry, regardless of what they did to you. They abused you, they hit you, they beat you, they were unjust towards you, they turned your siblings against you for control, they triangulated you with other siblings, they made you jealous of other siblings. Whatever it is that they used to get control, they don't understand that all of that has a consequence. And they feel the pinch of it in old age when their kids don't want to be around them. This is a major problem. We are seeing more and more Muslim parents, you know, being sent to, you know, care homes. Care homes in their old age because their kids just don't want to deal with them anymore. They don't want to deal with them anymore. And, you know, on another note as well, a lot of parents who raise their children to believe that they are better than others if they pray and fast and wear the hijab properly and and do all those things, you know, the rituals to make them look good in society. Like, oh, wow, look at my kids. I want everyone to say, mashallah, their kids all go to the mosque every Friday and, you know, they wear the hijab from the age of 10 and they do it for society, right, more than their own children. They're not thinking about the health and well-being of their children during all of this. I'll give you an example in a minute of that. But they raise their kids to make them believe that they're better than other kids who don't do that. So a lot of these children grow up with an arrogance, you know, and they're very judgmental of other Muslim children who don't pray and don't fast and don't wear the hijab. They look down, they, they're taught to look down upon other Muslim kids who don't do all of those things. They now believe that they're entitled to a place in Jannah because I do all of these things and you don't, you're all going to hell. You're all going to the hellfire, you're all going to get punished. So a lot of Muslims, they grow up with this arrogance that my parents taught me that if I remain like this, if I show the world that I'm very religious, that I'm better than everybody. I'm the one who's going to go to Jannah and not everyone else. And yet that's why you get adults who are so judgmental, so judgmental of other Muslims. No one is more judgmental than one of those entitled Muslims. I've never come across anyone as judgmental as them. They will pick on everything, everything that you do wrong, all your faults to make them feel better. But deep inside, they just want to be like everyone else. They want to have a good time like everyone else. They want to, you know, it's, it's jealousy that they don't have the freedoms that other Muslim kids have or other non-Muslim kids have. They're restricted, so they have to justify it in, them, you know, in their own minds that I'm doing the right thing and I'm going to be the one who has the last laugh. It's not a right way of raising kids to have that arrogance, to look down upon people who are not as religious as they are. And it's not even them being religious, it's just them showing that they're practicing. Because inside there is no, if there's no love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's no religion. There's no religion. You cannot be religious if you don't love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you don't enjoy your prayers, if you don't enjoy doing the worship rituals. When you're forced into it, that's not religion. Religion without any spirituality and an enjoyment for the worship, that's not religion, that's not Islam. So what you have is a uniform that you are forced to wear, a heavy uniform. You don't agree with it, you don't like it. 
And now you're jealous that everyone else hasn't been forced to wear it the same as you. Because you don't understand it. You don't understand why you have to be this way and other people are not that way. So to make yourself feel better, you need to believe that you're better than other people. That's how you get through life. That's how you get through life. And people start that way from childhood and they carry on with them until until uh, adulthood. So all those people who nitpick, you know, they ignore everything good about you. All the good work that you do, all the good things that you say. And then you'll do something. And they'll be like, you know, for example, a woman might be wearing nail polish or she might have done her eyebrows. And they're like, oh, sister, your eyebrows. Ignoring everything else, ignoring the 99% of the good that you do. Those are the people who come and target your eyebrows because <laughs> they're done. Or you wearing nail polish when you shouldn't. Or you wearing makeup because you're a hijabi and you shouldn't. They pick on all of those little things. It's like, what about the rest of the good that I've done? You think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to throw me in hell for wearing nail polish or wearing a bit of makeup? But that's what we're raised to believe. That's what our parents raise us to believe. That if you show a little bit of hair, if you put a little bit of nail, you know, nail polish on, if you do this, if you do that, you're going to get punished. You're going to be hung from your hair. You know, you're going you're gonna to drink boiling water. You're going to have all your nails ripped off on the Day of Judgment. Oh, oh, I'm telling you, I'm not even joking. This is what parents tell their kids. I'll tell you something funny. Well, it wasn't funny at the time. But um, I remember when we were little, because we grew up in a very English area, okay? So we didn't have Muslims in our area. So my father put us in a Church of England school. And, you know, we had all our friends were non-Muslim friends. And they, they had their birthday parties. So I remember my brother, he was about seven at the time. And he was invited by one of his friends to go to a birthday party. And, you know, these, those kids own soft play um, places. And, you know, my dad had taught us to never, you know, we can't eat ham. Because we used to see them eat ham sandwiches and we used to ask for it. And my dad was like, no, that's haram, that's this, that's that. And other things as well, right? Gelatin, sweets, we couldn't eat the same sweets as them. And we just found it very restricting. So anyway, my brother went to this party and, you know, he had a great time, ate the food there, everything was great. And he came back home and my dad went to go and pick him up and he said, oh, so how was the party? You know, did you have a good time? He's like, yeah, you know, dad had a great time. And my dad asked him, what did you eat? So he was telling oh, we had pizza and we had these sticks, you know, those sticks where they put cheese pineapple and a sauce you know those tiny little you know um pork sausages so my brother said I had you know I had some of them and my dad looked at him and he said to him you had those sticks and my brother was like yeah he's like did you know that that's pork and my brother looked at him horrified absolutely <laughs> absolutely horrified because he'd eaten the the sausages without realizing that they were pork and he started crying and my dad was like, that's it, you've got worms, you know, your your stomach's riddled with worms, you're going to get tapeworm now, you're going to get this and you're going to get that, I told you don't touch pork, I told you don't eat ham, I told you this, I told you that. And my brother's there crying and crying and crying because he was horrified. I'm telling you, for about 24 hours he was terrified of going to the toilet <laughs> because of what my dad had told him about worms. And he connected it to Islam, right? So he connected pork being forbidden to Islam. And then he connected that to worms. And then my brother became terrified of going to the toilet. He was so scared of, like, worms coming out. So it was a trauma for him. It was a trauma for him to, you know, to have gone through that. There was no, re there was no, there was no reason for my father to have um, reacted in that way. He could have said, okay. I'm telling you now, what you ate was pork. Next time when you see those sticks or anything, if you're unsure, you know, please go and ask an adult. Go and ask, you know, your friend's mom, what is this? Because if it's pork, you just tell them I'm not allowed to eat it. That would have been such a better way of a parent dealing with that situation because the child didn't know. Um, 
then completely scaring the pants of a little seven-year-old. And I remember it. I remember it so clearly like it was yesterday. Parents do this, you know, parents use that scare tactic to make sure that their kids never do it again. So if they can horrify you about something or horrify you into not (laughs) doing something again, they will. They will. My dad was famous for doing that with us. Like we, you know, we really struggled with things like that with my dad because it was the only way he could get compliance from us. My mum was different. My mum was a lot more balanced and she would try and balance it out but my father went straight to scaremongering tactics straight there from zero to 100 so we were always terrified of telling dad about things that we'd done mistakes that we'd made we were always so terrified of him because we knew what was coming we'd either get punished for it in various different ways or we didn't want that feeling of you know being complete failures and upsetting dad because if we upset dad it means we're going to hell So, you know, I'm just using my personal experiences here because it makes it easier when I speak about um, what I went through in order to give you examples that you can relate, you know, you could apply and relate to your own situations. I mean, another thing that would happen to us, um, so again, because we were raised in a non-Muslim environment, my dad would always tell us that we're very different from everybody and we have to dress differently and we have to be differently and act differently because you know, Muslims don't act like non-Muslims. So for example, you know, um, I was the only hijabi in the school. I was the only hijabi in the school, Church of England school, because my dad was trying to get us into the mindset of being different. So all the girls wore skirts, I wore trousers, I wore full hijab, absolutely hated it. Hated wearing the hijab. I wore it from about 11, 11 years old. Because, you know, back in those days, you know, girls would talk about boys and boys would talk about girls. And my dad freaked out and he thought, if I don't put a hijab on this girl now, God knows what's going to happen to her. So we got thrown into the deep end because we were raised in a very English area, a very English Christian area. So instead of him being more compassionate about raising children who are so different from the other children in that area, he would just, you know, push us right into the deep end with it. So, um, like he would he would make us conform to an Islamic identity or an Arab identity, a Saudi identity, without taking into consideration how that would affect us in the society that we were brought up in. Again, this is a narc trait. This is a narc trait that, you know, is found in so many parents until now even in in our generation you'll find it so anyway he managed to convince or well, me and my sisters that we had to dress and be a certain way because that's how all muslims acted i think that's one of the reasons why my father didn't raise us in a muslim community because it was easier for him to control our upbringing right because we're not seeing other muslim kids and families so anyway um i remember going to saudi that year and I remember seeing everyone that I knew, all my cousins, dressed in the same way as those who weren't Muslim. So I got confused and I was like, you know, Dad, you said that only Muslims dress in the way that I dress. How come, you know, our cousins who are girls, you know, they don't have to cover, they're wearing skirts. And I'm talking about, you know, when we went to family gatherings, they would all wear what they wanted. My uncles are are liberal, so they didn't raise their daughters in the same way my father raised us so my uncles were super chilled super cool you know they didn't have that strictness and they weren't um you know their kids were not raised with a very strict strict islamic upbringing so my uncles were very lenient with their with their daughters so when we used to go i used to really question a lot of things like hold on if i'm meant to be muslim and arab then who are they because they're not dressed in the same way I'm dressed. So it caused a lot of confusion and there was no explanation for it. My dad did not know how to explain that not everyone raises their kids in the same way. Some parents are more lenient, some parents are... He didn't know how to explain it. So it would always be a case of, I'm your parent and you do as I say. And that's it. And by the way, you'll find that if you have, if you're a woman and you have a father like that or you had a father like this, 
you will get a husband like that too, because that's what happened to me. I got a carbon copy of my father later, podcast for another day. But it comes from there. If you're used to having a man tell you that I'm the one in authority and you listen to me, you will find that you'll marry a man exactly the same later on. Because you carry that childhood trauma into your adult relationships. I married a carbon copy of my dad. It's insane. And this is the danger of not being aware of your Islamic upbringing. So if you're a teenager listening to this, I really want you to be aware of the, the serious need of breaking the cycle so that you do not get someone like your parents. You don't get anyone like your parents. Because that's what you will attract because it's what you're familiar with. Okay? So going back to the hijab story, because I know a lot of people can relate to this. Every time I tell someone the story, they can relate to it. Um, especially if they were raised in, you know, a um, a non-Muslim community. So my father pressurised my mom to make me um, go to school um, from 11 years old wearing a hijab. There's a funny story attached to this as well that I will, I will tell you. So the hijab that I wore back then, it was, you know, the big, um, the big triangle one where you need the big um, safety pin underneath your chin <laughs> to hold it together. So I would wear that to school and I was forced to wear it, to be honest. And my brother, because he went to the same school as me at the time, he would see me in the playground and everything. He was told to spy on me. So now his his um job was to spy on me at school to make sure that I was seen with my hijab on so that I don't go to school and take it off. Another thing I hated about my Islamic upbringing is that I felt everything was forced and I was too scared of my dad at the time to ever think of taking it off. I was terrified of my dad. So I would never dare take it off. And then I ended up just getting used to it. I got bullied at school for it, teased at school for it, because I was the only girl in the school who covered that way. We were the only brown kids in the school. So the way that my father pushed us straight into that deep end was just, you know, it's just cruel as a parent to be doing that to your kids, right? So anyways, so my he got my my brother to be the flying monkey and um like monitor what I'm doing. In a way, it helped me because I just ended up getting used to it. Everyone got used to me wearing a hijab. It no longer became a problem. The funny story that's attached to this is that the year that I wore hijab, the same year when we went and saw my uncle, my uncles and, and their kids, we were invited to a Saudi wedding. And it was the first Saudi wedding that we'd ever attended, right? So I was about... I was, yeah, I was about 11, 12, and my brother's two years older than me. He was about nine by this by this time. So when you go to a Saudi wedding, um, the boys are all requested, you know, or required to wear the thob and the shimach with the igal, which is, you know, that red headdress of the Saudis with the, with the black, with the back uh, rope thing and the white thob. And girls, you know, can go wearing the fanciest dress that they have. So anyway, so we're all staying with my uncle and it was the wedding of one of my aunties, one of my young aunties. And we were all really excited. First time we go to a, you know, a wedding and we were super hyped up and all of us were really excited. So it was the first time that my brother wears the traditional Saudi, you know, the Saudi um, dress. So he went upstairs and I have a cousin who's exactly his age. So my cousin said to him, look, I'm going to, I'll give you one of mine. I'll give you one of my thobs, my shemals and my and my regards to wear. So my brother was like, okay, cool. So anyway, he went into the bathroom to go and get ready. And then he came out and he was looking for a safety pin everywhere. He was asking <laughs> everybody who has a safety pin. No one knew why he needed a safety pin. And then my auntie ended up giving him one. So we're all downstairs and my brother's the one holding us up. We're waiting, waiting, waiting. You know, we need to go to this wedding. And my brother's taking forever. And then we hear the bathroom door open. My brother comes down the stairs. He's like nine years old. And he comes down in his thob. And the shimar, the headdress that, you know, the, the, the Saudi men wear, it's triangle in shape. So what he'd done, because he saw that it was triangle in shape and he was so used to me wearing my my triangle shape hijab, he was looking for a safety pin to hold the shimar underneath, <laughs> underneath his chin 
So he came down wearing it like a hijab. And I'm telling you, in all my years of living, I had never seen my dad and my uncle laugh as hard as they did that day with my cousins. Like when they saw my brother come down with a hijab because of the way that he tied his shimach. It was the funniest thing in the world. And I just had to mention it because it really, really made everyone laugh. Until now, it's like what 20, 20 odd years later. And they're still laughing about it. And they still remind him of it every time they see him. And it's a trauma for him. <laughs> it's a trauma for him because he didn't know. You know, he didn't know how to wear the Saudi dress. He didn't know that it was supposed to be flipped up at the top rather than <laughs> tied with a safety pin under his chin. It was really funny. And I really wanted to share that with you. But yeah, I hope like I've, you know, made it clear how a toxic Islamic upbringing can really be so detrimental to the spiritual life of children and adults and how, you know, such a toxic view of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can ruin, can ruin someone's Islamic future, you know, a future as a Muslim. And it can ruin their hereafter as well. You know, all parents will be held accountable for the way that they raise their children Islamically. Because we all have... A responsibility upon us to seek the right kind of knowledge we have to seek the right kind of knowledge if there's knowledge that seems off or too harsh or too difficult to to practice and implement we have to leave it the prophet Muhammad said that you know a deen yusr a deen yusr it's easy deen is easy and it's moderate the moderate way is the best way the prophet Muhammad said that if you go extreme the extreme way you're going to deviate and if you go the loose way you know, where everything is too easy and too chilled, you're going to lose yourself. Find the moderate way. Find the moderate way. Stop telling your kids that they're going to be, you know, hung by their necks on the Day of Judgment if they don't do something for you. You've got to stop doing it. Because not only will they resent you, you will not find them in your old age. They won't find themselves either. They'll become so narcissistic or so traumatised and codependent that they will be drawn to people who are like that. They will be drawn to men and women who use Islam in such a toxic way to control and abuse. You'll get one or the other. Empaths. Empaths are different. The empath child will know that something's just not right with this, with the way that their parents are. They will find their own way later in life. Because they use their intellect, right? They use their minds. But the codependent is so trauma bonded so that they seek similar people as adults. And the narcissist is so impressed by the power that they have obtained from, you know, they themselves being manipulated in, the, in that way. Because it worked on them, they believe it's going to work on their own kids and their own wives and their own husbands. Because they know it worked on them. They know there's something really wrong with their understanding of Islam, but it works for me. It works for me to be like that. If everyone's scared of me, wonderful. If everyone says yes, sir, to me, wonderful. If everyone tiptoes on eggshells around me, brilliant. That's what I want. That's what makes me feel important. That's what makes me feel grandiose. That's what makes me feel powerful. Sorry for the long podcast, but I needed to explain it from the core issue, the core root problem to this, so that you understand how we got here, how we still have these communities today. And if you're struggling with your iman, you'll understand why. And if you're a parent who's doing this to your children, stop doing it. Stop doing it and start seeking the right kind of knowledge and let your children love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Teach them how to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm telling you, it wasn't, it's a miracle I'm still Muslim today, I'm telling you. From my father's upbringing. It's a miracle. And I only discovered a beautiful side of Islam. I saw it in my mum, but... When you're a child, you want something out of the home. You don't want anything to do with... You don't want to learn from your parents because you're so... You're so sick of having to deal with family life. It wasn't until college, college slash early years of university, when I came across very beautiful Muslims as well. Peaceful Muslims. They were more Sufi Muslims, but... I was like, wow. These people are so nice. And a lot of us come across Islam that way. We come across, you know, beautiful people who give us a different understanding of the deen. And we 
renew our faith. We renew our understanding of religion and we start to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We start to learn about, you know, the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it was only until college did I start to accept myself wearing hijab. Until then, I hated it. Absolutely hated it. You will get to a point, you'll find a point in your life where something will change. You start to seek knowledge, you start to meet new, you know, different kinds of people. You start to meet parents of other Muslims who are completely different from your parents. And you think, why are my parents not like that? Why are their parents so calm and so friendly and so loving? And they're so close to their kids and their kids love them and they love being around them. Why are my parents not like that? And then you understand it's a different upbringing and it's a different perception of Allah and it's a different perception of Islam. I used to come across, um, you know, when I used to come across my cousins and they've got amazing relationships with my uncles. But my dad used to look down upon my uncles because he thought they were way too liberal, way too liberal. But actually, my uncles are a lot happier than he ever was. And my uncles have great relationships with their children, unlike he has. Because, you know, even though my uncles are a bit too liberal sometimes... However, their children respect them. They don't, you know, their children would do everything out of love, you know, to make sure that, you know, my uncles are not upset. And they're just really good friends. They're very close to my uncles. What's better? What's better in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yeah, you're slightly more liberal. You still believe in Allah. You'll still pray. You're still practicing. But you're lenient. You're, you're just chilled. You're cool. You've got a great relationship with your kids. Your kids love you and they want to be around you and they want to do what makes you happy. They, they consider you before they, you know, they, they commit a sin that might ruin your social reputation or affect you negatively. They think about that. They're not rebellious. You know, you trust them. You trust your kids because you know that they're not out to get you. They're not out to rebel against every single thing you've taught them. What's better? Being a little bit more liberal or being a staunch Islamist and having your kids not only hate you, but hate Allah and hate their religion. It's just food for thought, right? I'm not saying that people should be, you know, very liberal and everything. But it's just for you to understand that being so strict and using Islam to manipulate will only backfire on you in the end. You will be the one who will be left lonely. You won't have kids who will pray for you. They will not be your sadaqa jariya. They will not be your sadaqa jariya. And when the, when the West try to eliminate Islam from societies and they try to secularise everything a lot of Muslims support that a lot of Muslims are becoming very liberal and they're supporting all this, you know all of these campaigns against Islam with the rise of Islamophobia and all these terrorist attacks and honour killings and domestic violence it's embarrassing, it's embarrassing to be recognised as a Muslim for a lot of people out there while Islam is being connected to all of these horrible crimes in the name of Islam. A lot of Muslims don't want to associate themselves with Muslim communities. They don't even want to look like Muslims. They'll remove their hijab and they, they'll shave their beards and they'll look as Western as possible. They prefer to look Sikh and Hindu and, you know, from any other religion, but not Muslim. Because they are so disgusted by their own upbringing and what they see in you know around you know in their environments and societies as crimes in the name of religion honor killings is a is a massive one it still happens where women are being killed because they were caught with a boy or you know caught in a relationship or why are they killed this is haram why are you killing your kids teach your kids understand from your daughter why she did that why she felt the need to go and get a boyfriend why your your son felt the need to go and dabble in drugs understand why your kids do that rather than just jump to punishment and jump to them making you know making them feel like they're a complete disappointment and that there's no hope and that they're useless and that god will never accept their repentance who are you to say that who the hell are you to say that as a parent honestly it's no wonder a lot of people leave islam it doesn't shock me at all it really doesn't because of this it all comes from your upbringing and on a bigger scale on a on a, on a yeah on a much bigger scale 
one of the things that's happening in Saudi Arabia now as well is that when the um the Islamic structure, the Wahhabi Islamic structure was in place, was put in place in in, in Saudi society, a lot of people um became far too conservative. Okay, it was like Saudi used to be a highly conservative country before the Wahhabi understanding of Islam was implemented in public life. Okay, so you had religious police, you had a lot of misogynistic um shayur, you know, preaching Islam and they were very harsh, they never smiled. If you watch any of their videos, they are not pleasant people, they never smile, they're always depressed, they're always angry. And you think, why would I want to be one of them? I don't want to turn into one of them. But that's what we had, okay, in Saudi. And the system was so oppressive back then, like women couldn't get a divorce, women didn't have access to their children, if a man just took off with it, we know, with her children... Um, a woman had to have permission from her husband, from her male relatives to travel, work, get an operation, study, you know, all of these things. A woman had to, you know, get written permission or electronic permission. So there was a lot of oppression, a lot of oppression. I'm telling you, to get a divorce as a woman in Saudi used to take years for some women. Years. Even though it was clear that the man was a drug addict and he's just refusing a khula. So the sheikh's like, well, he's refused the khula. Until he has mercy on you, I'm not granting a divorce because it's haram. One year, two year, three years, four years, nothing. He's still saying, no, nope, I do not. But the guy's a clear drug addict. Women used to wait for years. I know my mum's friend, she waited seven years before she got her khula, coming and going to the court. Sometimes she'd go to the court and the judge wouldn't even turn up. He just doesn't turn up. No notice, no apology, no nothing. And then they'd have to reschedule an appointment for her, which was six months later, because the courthouses were so full. That's what life was like in Saudi for women. So many women could not study, could not go to university because the husband says, nope, you're not going. Or the father says, no, you're not going, you're not working, you're not doing anything, you're not travelling. So there was a lot of oppression, okay, in the name of Islam. Because they would say that all of this is happening because the mahram is the wali and the wali has authority. And because of that, you know, women don't have a say in what the men and the mahrams in their family um, tell you to do. So the government would step back and be like, no, we're not interfering. Whatever your mahram says is what you do. You say, yes, sir. So there was a lot of oppression, a lot of oppression in Saudi. It's sickening how much oppression happened in Saudi back in those days. Because I worked in a courthouse. I went and I took a lot of cases from the courthouse. And I was doing it when I um was uh, studying for my PhD because I wanted to know what was going on in the social justice system. And it was horrific. I was interviewing women, you know, sitting in the waiting rooms. Stories that I wouldn't even tell you in podcasts because they're so depressing. But what would happen is that because it was connected to Islam, all of this oppression, incorrectly of course, a lot of people rebelled against Islam. So the, the children of those people, of those women who are being oppressed in courthouses, they're like, you know what, first thing I'm going to do, apply for a scholarship, get out of this disgusting country. It's Balad al Haramain. it's the country of Mecca and Medina, a country Muslims are meant to love. And so many young Saudis were desperate to get out. Desperate to get out of Saudi. It's just a facade what you see on the outside. You know, Mecca, Medina, everyone should be pious, everyone should be religious. It wasn't like that because of the Islamic upbringing. That very overly strict Wahhabi understanding of Islam, right? The, the staunch Salafist kind of um, understanding of Islam, which is again, like I was saying before, where they want people to live like they did in 7th century Arabia it's not possible it's not possible the rules are too strict there are things that you have to adapt to in this time there are things that you need to fifi ishtihad ishtihad al ulama ishtihad al ulama is we live in a different time okay how can we how can we work around this so this is for the position of the scholars right so when when the scholars are faced with a social problem that wasn't you know it didn't happen back in the the time of the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi now they have to get together in unison and 
you know, agree on what, you know, what's best to do Islamically in a situation. They didn't do that. In Wahhabi Islam, that's not how it works. Wahhabi Islam is, you live like the Prophet. You live exactly how he lived and how the Sahaba lived. It's not possible. Even Ali radiallahu anhu said, do not force your children to live the same life that you did because they belong to a different time. This is Islam. You cannot raise your children in the same way that you were raised. It was a completely different generation. Islam makes account for the difference in generational gaps. It makes account for that. So what happened with when Muhammad bin Salman came into power, the crown prince, because now he's secularizing Saudi, um, he abolished all of that. He took out the religious police. He gave women rights. Women can now get a khula in f- less than 48 hours. You can apply for it online. Divorce went up by, I think, 73% in the first two years of Muhammad bin Salman coming into power because of how easy it was for women to get a khula. And they were dying and waiting for that day where they could break free from these, you know, disgusting, misogynistic, horrible, oppressive men. They'd waited for years. Many women had waited for years. There were women in their 60s and 70s applying for khula because there was hope for them to just live a normal life away from such toxic, oppressive men. So um, there's no more permission now to be taken from the mahram. A woman can travel, a woman can work, a woman can drive a car, a woman can study, a woman can do whatever she wants now in Saudi. So they've linked that to Muhammad bin Salman taking away Islam from society to give women rights. And that's a problem. Because now a lot of Saudis are becoming very secular because they've been programmed to believe that our societies were so toxic because of Islam, because Islam was being implemented in our societies. And now Muhammad bin Salman is secularizing everything. It means that Islam was the problem because now we have rights, now we have freedoms, now we can be happy, now we can live like normal human beings like everyone else around the world. This is what happens. So when children grow up knowing this, they don't want Islam. The new generation of Arabs and Saudis and Qataris and Emiratis, they're seeing all of this now. And they're like, you know what? Yeah, Islam is the problem. Because now everything's better. Now everything's better and everyone's got freedom and they're happier and they're, they're jolly. But it's because Islam was being implemented in the wrong way. In a toxic, cultural, oppressive, patriarchal society. Which is why it went wrong and it all went pear-shaped. So when children, the new generation of Saudis, honestly, I fear for them because they are already learning that this is better. Secularization is better. Liberal, you know, to be liberal is better. So the new generation are not going, I don't think they're going to use Islam like our parents did. I think they're going to be very liberal. They're going to go the opposite way. So there won't be any more Islamic upbringing. And that's the danger that we're facing right now with the secularization of the Arab world. And, you know, the Muslim world in general, you've got to be really careful because development now and progression is seen in the secularization of communities and countries. So it's so important. I'm going to end this now. It's so important for you guys to, if you're single and you're looking to get married, choose people who are going to help you raise the next generation of children in a beautiful Islamic way to continue the Prophet Muhammad's legacy. You've got to continue it. Because if you don't, the liberals are going to take over and there will be no more Islam. There will be no more beautiful Islam. It will be a case of either being very liberal and secular or oppressive and practicing Islam in a very toxic way and being very narcissistic. There will be no more middle ground because that's being depleted now. It's being depleted. People are marrying the wrong people. Marry a woman who's going to be an excellent role model for your children, who's going to raise your children in a very loving, you know, in a very loving Islamic way. And marry a man who's going to do the same, who's going to help support that. He's got the same vision as you. He's got the same understanding of Islam as you. And he will help you to raise the next generation of Muslims in the best way so that they do grow up being like the children from the Islamic Golden Age. We need to take lessons from the Islamic Golden Age and 
really invest in the qualities that our kids have and place them in the right areas in life, nurture them in the right areas in life, allow them to grow, you know, in the areas that they find their strengths in. And you'll be successful as a parent because not only will you um, win them over as children, they'll always have a good relationship with you until your old age, they will also... Um, do well in society, they'll contribute so well to society, and they'll also be also the khajariya. So you will reap the the fruits of what you sow. And those fruits have to be your sadaqa jari. You don't raise children just for this dunya, you raise them for this one and the next. And you'll be questioned about your choice of husband and wife and a future, you know, parent for your children. You'll be questioned about that. That's their first right in this dunya, your choice of parent for them. So, I'll end it here. I hope you've enjoyed the podcast, inshallah. I hope it's been beneficial for you. I hope it's been healing for you as well to know that you're not the only person who's been through such a horrible upbringing and, you know, um, and I hope it's given you answers. And just know that a lot of people can relate to this. A lot of people have been raised in the same way. Every time I speak to people, they're like, oh, my dad too, or my mum too, or, you know, like, it's, it's, it's a... Uh, it's a serious problem a lot of people have faced, you know, in their childhood. A lot of childhood trauma comes from that. So please do share this video with anyone who you think could really benefit from it. Please do like, share and subscribe to the channel. So much more information is coming. I've got a huge long list of subjects I need to get through. So thank you so much for listening until now, if you have. And until the next podcast, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.